Molson sponsored it for a while. Stroh's sponsored it for a while. If you ever want to test your loyalty to a sponsor, yeah. drink Stroh's beer for an entire season. <laughs> Hey everybody, I'm Dave Moody, and this is the Derek Pernasiglio Show. Can I drive you? Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the show. You know who I am, but the most important person is the guest, and we have the godfather himself. It's a huge treat to have him here, Dave Moody. Thank you for being here on the show. This is awesome for us. My pleasure. Looking yeah. forward to it. It's going to be fun. Always enjoy having a uh, a fellow colleague in, in, that works in the media end of it too. First of all, great shirt too. Love the uh, I right? love the snowball there. I know shirt. I know where you come from. I know where your focus is. <laughs> right? Short tracks, okay. Short tracks, absolutely. But uh, let's get to you though. Uh, first off, uh, you've been you travel. You've been traveling for God knows how long. You know, 30, 40 years now. 35 years 35 with Motor years. Racing Network. Full or part-time, 35 years. And uh, Sirius Speedway has now celebrated, what, its 20th year yeah. on air? Yeah, 20 years this past November. That's amazing. Yeah. It, we it, went on the air. We went on the air the day after Matt Kenseth won the 2003 championship. What a great time to start a new <laughs> motorsport show the day after the right. season. But, okay. You um, know how it is. red tape and bureaucracy and things like that. The yeah. the debut got pushed back like six months. And, okay, so. But here you are 20 years later, though. I mean, God, it, it was show there. Miracle. Right, working MRN. Uh, you know, you've been turn one and two for forever. Uh, is, is that your thing? Like, is the turn one and two thing your thing? You, do you enjoy being there rather than the booth or pit road? I love it. Um, and there there was an opportunity, you know, back when uh, when Joe Moore uh, stepped down and when Barney Hall retired. There, there was a lot of discussion about who was going to go to the booth. And at that point in time, my bosses at MRN kind of felt like we want our booth guys to be just us, just ours. We don't want you doing the Sirius XM. We don't want you doing anything. We want you to be a dyed in the wool MRN guy. So from a purely selfish point of view, I wasn't going to take a 50% pay cut to go to the booth. Hmm. Okay. I love it out in the turns, right? Yeah. You get to work on your tan and, uh, <laughs> you know, so uh, I, I love it out there. And uh, so I've been there ever since. I'm very happy with it. And uh, you did it old school style inside those 76 balls back in the day, right? Very like, briefly, but yes. Okay. What were those like on a hot summer day? Brutal. Were they really? Yeah. <laughs> Go to hell, turn the thermostat up eight degrees. Right. Those those 76 balls, they were steel. They were The walls of the ball was about that thick. Oh, my God. You'd have a hatch that you climbed up through the floor, and you'd have a window that wasn't very big. It was maybe three feet tall and about six feet wide. Right. And if you look at the old pictures of those Union 76 balls, you always saw somebody hanging. Some guy, some skinny kid hanging out of it with no shirt on, right? <laughs> he's not hanging out that window to get a better view. He's trying to breathe. Right. Because on, you know, Talladega. It's an oven. Daytona in July right. on a on a 98 degree day, they'd probably be 120 degrees inside there. Oh, my God. Inside a metal ball. Yeah. Amazing. They'd be pulling Ricky Rudd out of the car and packing him in ice after the race. And it's like, where's mine? Right. I need some too. But now you're in an open stand though, right? Yes. Okay. All right. Do you have any protection from the elements? Like if it rains or anything no. like that? Okay. So you've no. got to stand there. And... Whatever it's doing, it's doing on me. Okay. Yeah. So every weekend you pack for rain or shine no matter yes. what. Sunscreen is my friend. Uh, <laughs> yes. You pack, you pack for every eventuality. Speed Weeks is always an, a, 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 a crapshoot because some of those Friday night truck races, it can be 40 degrees, 45 degrees, mm -hmm. and there's no cold like a Florida cold, right? right? And you freeze to death. Right. And then, you know, you, you come back the next day and it's 88 and mm -hmm. the sun's beating down on you. So you I just, know. you better love Mother Nature if you're going to do that job. Those years in Daytona were just so brutal because there, we, we, you know, we worked down there with the TV crew. So you're up at the crack of dawn, oh, yeah. you know, and there are some mornings where there's frost on the ground. And then three or four hours later, you're pulling off every layer of clothing because you're sweating your ass off because, yeah. you know, now it's the Florida sun. And all it takes now then is for a rain cloud to come through right. and wet you down. And then the wind picks up and then you're freezing again. It's so bipolar at that time. And back in our younger days, you know, speed weeks at Daytona. Yeah, you were up at the crack of dawn, but you were probably still up at the crack of dawn. You know, there was a little bit of a social component to speed weeks back then, which we've, we've kind of lost because we took that two-week speed weeks thing and mm -hmm. condensed it all down into six days. So okay. we're... We're packing a lot. What's the old saying? Ten pounds of you know what in a five pound bag. That's yeah. what we're doing. 
doing now at Daytona. Yeah, I know. But are are you happier though that it's less of a schedule? Because I remember we would go down there for three weeks at yeah. a clip sometimes. Yeah. yeah, I'm happy and I'm not happy. You, you lose something and you gain something. Mm-hmm. You're not on the road for two weeks, and that's that's awesome. The older you get, well, at least for me, the older I get, the less enamored I am with airplanes and rental cars and hotel rooms. But at the same time, there used to be a little bit of social time. You know, you'd have two or three dark days at the track where yeah. where you could go out, you know, go out on a Ponce Inlet, get a couple of beers, get a little seafood. There, there's no time for that anymore. It's yeah. all just jammed in. So you got to have some stories from those years, though. You Not that I can some... tell. Oh, come on. This is, you know, we're, 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 uh, we're open here at the show. Plus, we have an R rating. So, you know, you can uh, you can say whatever four letter word you want. Let's just say <laughs> that back in, back in our day, Jeff Striegel and I, enjoyed once the race day was over at Michigan or Talladega or Watkins Glen, we'd jump on the MRN golf car and we'd just go out and go touring and, you know, seeing people, meeting people, having fun, have a cocktail maybe here or there. Yeah. You know, we, we'd always start, each one of us would start out with a beer in our hand and a backup in, a, in the glove compartment of the, <laughs> of the golf cart. And I'm proud to say that we never had to come back to restock. Race fans are very generous. Yes. And, and we, we never lacked for food or drink out there. You know what, though? I honestly think that that is not a bad thing because... Oh, it was you wonderful. Gained, are you kidding me? It was great. Well, that and also you get a, you connect with the fans plus yeah. you also gain fans too because that was say, our excuse right they'll yeah. say yeah dave yeah. moody came by it was so cool and hung yeah. out and we had beers and you know we just we bullshitted about the races or whatever we'd come back the next on sunday morning and like our our uh, engineer would look and say why is the golf cart out of gas like, <laughs> well we were we were doing social work for the <laughs> network class no we weren't right. we were drinking beer and eating lobster salad sandwiches <laughs> or whatever somebody was cooking out there it was great what about uh, down in daytona you got any funny stories from the ocean deck everybody's got ocean deck stories if you haven't <sighs> You know you've been to the ocean deck if you don't remember ever going to the ocean deck. <laughs> let's, just, let's just put it that way. We, right. And again, it was Striegel this night, but we had some friends that were uh, that were out of town, some friends of mine that were down there, and they ended up sitting at our table. They did not know Jeff. Mm-hmm. And and Jeff, being the magnanimous guy that he was, he every once in a while he'd jump up and he'd go get another round of cocktails. And at the end of the night, he walked away, and one of my friends leaned over and said, how cool is it that we're sitting here with the owner of the bar? It's like, wait, he's not the owner of the bar. He works with me at MRN. Oh, well, we, he was bringing us all these free drinks. We thought he owned the place. Like, no, no. That's great. Oh, my we're God. We're just thirsty. Yeah. So for uh, for someone like you, uh, obviously, you know, you've got to find the stories and things to talk about when you're at the racetrack. For any of the young announcers or people that are aspiring to, to start doing this, what does a day at the racetrack consist of for you when you get to the track? What is one of the first things to you do? Are you going to the production truck first? Or are you going in the garage to get notes? Fridays are, are the tough day. Mm-hmm. Friday, it's like up at 4 o'clock to go to the airport, fly to the racetrack, or you know, fly to the airport, get the rental car, drive to the racetrack. Then usually it's straight into the studio to, go th- to do the Sirius XM show. Used to be three to seven, now three to six this year, which is has helped a little bit. But and then I would get off the air many nights on Friday night. I'd get off the air at seven o'clock and immediately fly out to the turn position, climb the ladder, and start calling a truck race. Right. Fridays were the worst because there were a lot of times where I hadn't even seen the trucks yet. Right, I've, I've been in town or just long to enough anyone. to do my show. I don't know the paint schemes. I don't know, and you know how the trucks are. Every other week, there's a some of these trucks have a different driver. Mm-hmm. So sometimes you had to tap dance your way through Friday night. Saturday and Sunday, it's just a part of the job, man. You're in the garage and you're just walking that circle, running names and numbers and color schemes and sponsors and home tech to make sure that you got it. You know, I learned from Ken Squire a long time ago. He said, don't rely on a roster. If you've got a numerical in your hand, excuse me, you you may think you're in great shape. He said, but when the wreck breaks out, if you have to look down to see who it is, by the time you look up, you've missed the wreck. Mm -hmm. You got to know those names and numbers. And honestly, the the Sunday morning garage walk in the cup garage is the highlight of the weekend because Mm -hmm. I've been around long enough that I know a lot of people and, you know, crew chiefs and guys like that 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 
kind of, you know, they, they'll trust me and tell me what's really going on. Right. I learn more in about an hour and a half to two hours walking the garage on Sunday morning than I do the rest of the week combined. Okay. Now, are you taking notes and you write, are you writing stuff down or it's just random conversation and you just know it from memory? As a turn guy, I don't probably use 90% of what I learn in the garage because it, a turn announcer, your job is to describe what's happening in front of you. Right. They don't need us to do analysis. They don't need us to give you know deep thoughts on what happened last week or what might happen this week. Just tell me who's on the inside and who's on the outside. 90% of that stuff that I learn in the garage, I'll either use it on the show, on the Sirius XM show during the next week, or I might never say anything at all about it, Right. but you know in your head what's coming a week or two down the road, you know, and it's, even if you don't say it right out loud and and Barney Hall taught me this a long time ago. He said, he said, boy, when Barney liked you, called you boy, (laughs) that boy, I see you out there in the garage. You talk to a lot of people. They're telling you a lot of things, but you don't talk about them on the air. I said, no, Barney, I'm not, I'm not the kind of guy that wants to blow somebody's deal by talking about it too soon. He's Mm -hmm. like, that's exactly right. He said, you'll get, he said, you can go out there and get a big scoop. He said, but by Tuesday, every, everybody forgets who had the scoop. He said, but they'll never trust you again. Right. And Barney Hall in his career probably brokered more deals between drivers and sponsors and teams than anybody in the garage. Nobody ever knew it. Really? Yeah. Barney Barney would talk to Junior Johnson, and Junior would say, I'm getting ready. You know, I, don't, don't think I, I don't think my driver's coming back next year. Uh, trying to figure out who I'm going to bring in. Mm-hmm. And Barney would say, well, you know, so-and-so is not happy over here and so-and-so is not happy over there. And he'd just go and have these little clandestine conversations with people and say, you need to go talk to him and you need to go talk to him. He probably brokered 40% of the deals between drivers, crew chiefs, and sponsors in the garage back in the day. Nobody ever knew it. Really? That's Because he amazing. kept his mouth shut and he could yeah. keep a secret and he was trustworthy. And, and when you get that, you get respect too. That's exactly right. I gotcha. Uh, for you nowadays, is it becoming harder to keep up with the cars because i mean back in the day everyone you know a car kept its sponsor for the entire year like you knew their colors for the whole year like this was it this now they're they're changing looks week to week to week it's a lot harder it's a lot harder. you're right it's different week to week and you know people say well it's the same number well it, it is uh, but when somebody spins coming off turn two and everybody disappears into a bank of smoke, you might just see a little flash of color off the fender or you might see the hood or you might see a, a little bit of the tail panel. And, and if that's all you're going to see, you better know what that color scheme is. You better be able to identify that car based on about an 18-inch square piece that you saw through the fog. Wow. And uh, if you don't spend the time in the garage, it's really hard. Now, do you have to write down notes of what color they are, or do you kind of just look at the car and go, okay, he's in that one? It, 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 again, it, if you work off notes, you're looking down instead of up. Mm-hmm. So what works for me, and I don't, you know, what works for me may not work for anybody else, but what works for me is I got to spend an hour and a half, and you go to the garage at Daytona, and you just walk circles. And you look at every car, and in your head, you say name, number, sponsor name number sponsor and you just keep doing it mm-hmm. and doing it and by about your fourth trip around it's it's in your head and you're okay okay cool now for you uh let's go back to some of the early beginnings uh because you started off like a lot of us did calling you know local sports uh, and all of that and then get hired by ken squire yeah. i mean nascar hall of famer legend i un- i never got to work with him one-on-one we did have a conversation in a bar one time in daytona oh we boy got, we got to talking about islip speedway and uh-huh. he just i was at islip in 1970 when the cars came here yeah it yeah. was it was really cool i only got to hang out with him that one time but uh got to get hired by someone like ken who then you know of course worked with fred reinstein and they brought NASCAR to the forefront. Yeah. What was, how much did you learn from him? Oh, everything. Years? Right. Yeah, <laughs> it, I, I'm so blessed, Derek, and, and I say this all the time. I'm one of the very few people on planet Earth fortunate enough to have gone to Ken Squire High School and Barney Hall University. <laughs> the, the first race I ever saw when I was like six years old was at Thunder Road, Barry, Vermont, mm-hmm. Ken Squire's racetrack and fell in love with it never wanted never wanted to do anything ever again except just watch race cars go in circles and i went from you know over the course of years i went from fan to support division crew member started writing a little column for the old speedway scene newspaper out of massachusetts back then 
and the timing was right that when Ken started to get busy with CBS and started traveling the world for the CBS Sports Spectacular. Right, because he was doing more than just racing. Oh, sure. Right. Oh, yeah. He he would be on TV, you know, every Saturday. And one week it's the Acapulco <laughs> Cliff Divers. And the next week it's the World <laughs> Bodybuilding Championship. I mean, he did everything. Wow. But the thing was that it from time to time he would have to leave. We race on Thursday at Thunder Road, right? Mm-hmm. Thursday night, because that's when the local granite workers got paid on Thursday, and Ken wanted first crack at their money. Right. So you race on Thursday night, and there were times where he couldn't be there. And I still don't know why for sure. I never dared to ask him because I wasn't sure I wanted to hear the answer. I don't know why he picked me. Mm-hmm. I like to think that maybe he had read a couple of my columns in Speedway scene and said, okay, here's a kid that loves racing. He's got a workable vocabulary. Maybe I can teach him. Mm-hmm. So he grabbed onto me and he and he just started teaching me a little bit at a time how to do the short track announcing deal. Mm-hmm. And and over time, you know, I went from being the track announcer at Thunder Road to being the track announcer at Thunder Road and Catamount Stadium and then I added, you know, Lee USA over in New Hampshire and then Bear Ridge on the other side of Vermont and then you know, at one point in my quote unquote short track career, I was working, you know, Memorial Day to Labor Day, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, every single week, somewhere different. Just announcing races. Yeah. And right. you know, you know how it is. A lot of those nights I'd be coming home at three o'clock in the morning on a Sunday saying, if I don't pull into this McDonald's right now, I will gross two hundred dollars for the week. <laughs> right. You know? I know what you mean. Nobody yeah. getting rich at that time. But uh, I was learning so much. I, I it's so funny because I used to say that uh, you know, other people that are coming up, I'm like, when you drive you know, an hour to go do a race and get paid 50 bucks yeah. and you put 20 bucks in your gas tank and 10 bucks to eat, you know, and th- then you're, you know, then you're going home with maybe 10 bucks in your pocket or, or 15 or just, yeah, it, it kind of, it shows you, uh, you, you ask yourself, how bad do you want it? You figure you know? out real quick. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, when we were running the, the old NASCAR North tour, which now AC, which is now ACT on Sunday morning, We'd meet up at 5 o'clock in the morning. That's after having raced the previous night and the previous night and the previous night. We'd wow. meet up on Sunday morning. We'd drive eight hours to Ontario to race at Cayuga Speedway, practice, qualify, race, get right back in the same car and drive eight hours home. Oh, man. We were a lot younger. Yeah, right? I know. Younger and stupid. I couldn't do that. Now. I know. I, I, I know what you mean. Had a lot of fun, though. <laughs> those And those NASCAR North years were amazing, too, because... Yeah. They were just, you, you had guys like Beaver and Bobby Dragon, Robbie Crouch. I mean, it's where Randy LaJoy had, had come from, too. Yeah. You know, because what other what a lot of people down here don't realize, too, is that everyone thinks Northeast, they think modified racing. But when you go up into Maine, it is late model country up exactly there. Exactly right. Yeah, so. New England has, I don't know exactly where to draw the line. Yeah, but there, there's a border there. There may be a small demilitarized zone between the two, but Southern New England is open wheel modifieds, and Central and Western New York are open wheel modifieds. Yeah. But Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont—that's that's taxi cab country, it's, and that, that's late models. Yeah, pro stocks as they call them up there. Too. Now, yeah, it's super late models, pro stocks, depending on where you are, they they've got a different name. And I remember when when Ken and Tom Curley first decided to go touring because weekly racing could no longer pay a purse that would keep those steel bodied late models Mm -hmm. running anymore. They said, okay, we've got to take them on the road. Mm -hmm. And I remember not everybody thought it was a great idea. I mean, Beaver Dragon was the first champion of the NASCAR North tour in 1979. Still today, he will tell you that it wasn't a very good idea. Really? Oh yeah. Why why do those people, because they took us on the road. We went to Stafford. We went to Thompson. We went to Westboro. We went to Oxford. We went to Canada. Now, is that the series that became the Strohs tour? Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. Well, a number of different beer tours. Okay. Molson sponsored it for a while. Strohs sponsored it for a while. If you ever want to test your loyalty to a sponsor, yeah. drink Strohs beer for an entire season. <laughs> it was it was it was it was, not, it was not our first choice, but they you know they took good care of us, so we drank drank Strohs beer. Uh, yeah, there were uh, they, we had like three different beer sponsors over the course of the years, and, and such an international flair too, because you had guys from Canada coming. Oh, yeah. and like and you also race up in Canada, places like San Air and, and and places like that. We would go from the Canadian Maritimes, Quebec, out to uh, out, out to Ontario. We raced at a place called Sobble Sobble Speedway, Sobble Beach, Ontario. 
Go to Ottawa, hang a right, and drive six more hours. And that's about north. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah you're about you're about to Sable Beach at that moment. Wow. Okay. Now, yeah, we you, traveled. I'm sure you had to learn a little bit of French along the way, right? Um, I speak uh, I speak a uh, un peu de français. Really? Not enough to be not enough to be the announcer. Okay. So when we when we would go to one of those Quebec tracks like like Saint Air or Val Belair, Val Belair I could tell you stories about, but there were two announcers. Mm -hmm. I'd do the I'd do the English and the local guy would do the French and I'd talk a minute and he'd talk a minute. And <laughs> Everybody, everybody got the message eventually. That's cool. Yeah. That's interesting. And then eventually, you know, your career took you down to uh, working in radio with uh, MRN. Mm -hmm. yeah, I do remember you doing some TV for a little while too. A little bit. Yeah. Now, why, uh, why not pursue the the TV stuff? Well, you've heard the term "face made for radio." That was, <laughs> that, was a, that was a major factor. And also, and I've, I've had this conversation with Ken before he died. He would, in recent years especially, he would always get after me. Why don't you go for a TV job? You should be working in TV. There, there's a level of, of predictability and stability on the radio side with MRN and Sirius XM. We don't lose, you know, our contract doesn't come up for bid every 15 minutes, you know. Yeah. We don't change networks every 15 minutes. You know, I've been there 35 years. I've never once had a serious concern that my job was going to be in jeopardy in the next 18 months. Mm -hmm. So there's something to be said for that. The security. Yeah. yeah. No, I know what yeah. you mean. Working in television every year. Um, you a lot know. of people sweating. Oh, my God. I mean, in <laughs> November, December, you're calling, hey, could you use me for this? Hey, can you use me for that? And yeah. January rolls around and it's quiet and you start to worry and yeah. I, Are we getting the contract for next the next three years? I know. And all of those years that I did K and N and Modifieds, it was all a year to year to year to year uh, deal. So every January, I'm sitting on pins and needles, worried if they're going to have me back sleep, and sleep well at night. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then, you know, March or, or February would roll around. This is before they started doing stuff down in uh, New Smyrna, and they would be like, "Okay, you're back." And yeah. Okay, you know, now I can unclench for the next couple of months and yeah. make some money. It's like but, race car drivers. Do I have a ride for next year? Yeah. Same thing. I know. Um, the, with uh, the, all of the years that you have been around now, I mean, obviously, you know, you've seen the years of NASCAR with grizzled veterans, with, you know, fields of drivers in their 40s. Mm -hmm. Now we're seeing drivers in their teens, in their 20s. Yeah. What are some of the big uh, uh, differences that you notice between talking to those guys, those grizzled guys back then compared to the kids today. Sure. Yeah. I, I mean, Harry Gant was in his thirties before he ever drove a cup car. Mm. You know, he, he never drove a race car of any kind until he, you know, a lot of the, the old time drivers never drove a race car until they had their driver's license. So mm. at least 18, if not 21, mm -hmm. it's totally different now. These kids start at age four or five in go-karts, and they come up through Bandoleros and then Legends cars and then whatever stock car division or, or sprint cars or midgets they go into. These kids, by the time they're 18, are veterans. Right. In terms of on-track competition, in terms of the number of laps that they've turned, they're veterans. Mm -hmm. They may or may not be emotionally equipped to become adults. Right. And, yeah, yeah. and that's a little different sometimes. Mm -hmm. and I, I, in our super late model days, we raced out at Caraway, and on lap two of a 200-lap race, a 14-year-old kid put him four wide coming off turn four and stacked up about half the field. Yeah. It was a car sitting on top of the pit wall just doing the teeter-totter. Right. Uh, there, there, were, there, were there were a line of 50-year-old men that wanted to kill that 14-year-old <laughs> boy, but you... What can you do? He's a kid. Yeah, right. Oh, I know. I've yeah. been I've been put in a fence by kids before, and you go to get out of the car. And Can't you go even yell. yell at him. Right. And, you know, I got out of the car one time. The kid was 11, and he was half my size. And I was like. And half your size. Yeah, no, well, no, I, I know. Yeah. And I'm, I'm not big to it's begin not a, with. Right? Not a high bar to clear. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know? I'm yeah. only 5'7". Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, this kid was up to my waist, and I got out of the car mad, and I looked at him, and I'm like. Just forget. Never him. mind. Yeah, never mind. I know. It's different now. Uh, well, it's different. Now, it, it different in the sense of, is it just harder to pull stories out of the younger kids? It can be. Um, and we definitely see a progression in terms of not just what they do on the racetrack. They get better as racers, hopefully. Mm -hmm. But they also get better 
in front of cameras and microphones. Some of, some of these guys, you know, when you first get a hold of them, they are what we refer to in the business as yup, nope, guess so guys. Oh, I know. Right? Oh, if yeah. you need 15, if I put them on Sirius XM Speedway and I need 15 minutes, I better have 25 questions. Oh, yeah, I know what you mean. But but as as they mature, and you know, some of these, if they if they're lucky enough to get in with a big team, they send them to media school and they learn how to you know how to answer a question, and 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 eventually, fifteen minutes, it's six questions, seven questions. Right. It's a lot easier that way. It's so funny that you say that because it was uh, so funny because I saw they did an interview with Ryan Truex uh, either last week or the week before last, and did an interview fine and I sat there on the couch watching him because I started talking remember to him remember the days remember the days when he was driving the K&N car from Reticent Michael Waltrip Ryan Truex oh my god and, and you could <laughs> how's the car it's good yeah, pretty good yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. fine <laughs> so I was like, dude, you gotta, you gotta give me something, you know. It was, yeah, it, yeah I, I get it. And now seeing, seeing him now do an interview is just like, look at that. I'm like, he's he's come out of his shell. None of the true exes are real chatty Cathy, but <laughs> but Ryan was a little more brief. Yeah, they, you know, the, and the, the I will say the great part is too uh, with uh, Martin Senior, Junior, Ryan. They always took the time to talk to me, you, you know, it's yeah. all the time. So I, I definitely uh, always, always appreciated that. Yeah. Um, but for you, um, you know, you just brought up that you were doing the late model deal. Mm-hmm. First off, what possessed you to become a late model car owner? Well, um, back home in Vermont, a, a buddy of mine, his dad had raced. He had always worked on his dad's cars. And he came to me one day and he said, we had no, you know, like, Entry level street eight eight cylinder street stock division right old old novas you know stuff like basically put a roll cage in them and if you do much more than that you're illegal mm-hmm. and he came to me one day and he said let's build a race car well, that'd be cool let's build a race car so we built a race car and our first car we went to the racetrack with it and went out for the first practice and I walked from pit row uh, I walked from our garage area pit area out to the racetrack and couldn't find our car. I turned around and I looked and the car's back in the pits. I go over, it's like, what happened? Blew the engine. Really? Like literally went off turn one, went to turn two, dropped it in a high gear and kablammo, out she came, right? Uh-huh. So it was a junkyard special. Uh-huh. So we we messed around in that division for a while and, and won a few races, but mostly just had a really good time, you know, because mm-hmm. we weren't, you know, trophies are great, but if you're not having fun. And then he moved down to the Carolinas and I stayed in Vermont for another 10 or 12 years. And, and he started racing super late models and did reasonably well for the for the budget that they had. I mean, and then when I came down, he's like, yeah, I think I'm going to sell it because I just, I can't find any money. And it's, you know, we got guys that have got more money in their transporters than I have in our, our entire operation. Mm-hmm. I said, well, hang on a minute. I'm going to Daytona in a couple of weeks. Let me nose around down there, see if I can find a little something. Maybe I can find you some capital to work with. And, and unfortunately, I did. And and that turned into he and I, you know, fielding a super late model for six or seven years on the old past South Circuit. And and again, we were outspent a hundred to one. Right. But we could we could run top ten. Mm-hmm. On a good night, we could run top five. Mm-hmm. And then you know we'd we'd wait for all the tractor trailer you know cup level transporters to leave, and we'd push the car into our little twenty four foot box trailer and hook it up to our rusty dually and head for home <laughs> had a lot of fun when uh when was the last time you were back to to thunder road did you oh i get back and... every year okay so you go back yeah, every... at least once every okay. year and, and thunder road is is amazing because uh when you when the when the track runs the town shuts down like yeah. everyone is there yeah. like even the governor like you the governor of vermont races a pro stock right he he's the all well it's not a pro stock it's an act late model okay. it's kind of like a limited late model it's still late model yeah like a pro late model right. something like that yeah he's he's the he's a former track champion and the winningest driver in the division to this day and he hasn't raced full time in five or six years and he's the governor he's the governor he's the governor no, like, and he's not he's just phil he's phil you, scott you know if you never if you ever need any more of an endorsement for short track racing you know i mean a governor that races you know, because we just we had to deal with our issues over at Mountain Creek with getting shut down over there, right. and I, 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 I think I don't know what what your take is is that uh, racetracks in towns boost the economies, they help, they 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 lift mm-hmm. things up that that are over there. Unfortunately, you get the people that buy the house next to the racetrack and then freak out because there's a racetrack. I know. You know, and, and Phil will say, Phil will tell you in no uncertain terms. 
that driving race cars at Thunder Road was a major factor in him getting elected. Really? That the name recognition and the goodwill that he generated by being, you know, part of that racing community. Mm-hmm. You know, he, he didn't he didn't immediately enter politics and run for governor. He was, you know, he was a, a, a state representative and then lieutenant governor and now now the governor for a couple of terms. And he absolutely says that he probably would not have gotten elected if he hadn't been driving race cars. It's just that that fan base, that, that support. Man, that, right. He's it, not a politician. He's one of us. I watched him race at Thunder Road. He must be okay. Right. It, it, it's just amazing to, to how they do it now. Um, but with uh, all of that over the years, um, the big question that we've been asking everyone also this season is longevity in the sport. I mean, you've been around since the 80s. Um, what do people do to have that longevity, keep that longevity in the sport? Because we are seeing it is becoming harder and harder to stay in the sport. I mean, reporters are coming and going, you know, with, you know, with the bat of an eye. Yeah, it, it is tough, uh, especially, you know, when you get to the national level. The, the job is fantastic. If, I, I joke about this all the time. If, if they came up with a way that you could snap your fingers and go from where you are to where you want to be instantly. But in return, you had to forfeit a week off your life. There'd be people snapping. In our sport, there'd be people snapping their fingers every day. Oh, right. And, and, you know, if I die 10 years early, okay, fine. I'm not going to waste time at the airport anymore. I'm just going to get to where I go. A long way of saying this. The job is great. The travel is awful. I mean, the, the, yeah. nobody enjoys standing in a rental car line. Nobody enjoys, you know, waiting Getting to the check. Getting flight canceled. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. I know. You know, okay, we're, we're going to race on Monday now. 8,000 people are all calling the airline at the same time, trying to book the same 15 seats that are the only ones left to go home on Monday night. Mm-hmm. Those parts, nobody enjoys. Right. I get you. Um, but at... at but as far as like staying in it over the years, mm-hmm. what is what is it that someone like yourself has done? You, you, you know it. that uh, you know you could teach others to to do. I think it it's kind of like being circus people, you know, <laughs> the carnival lifestyle. Yeah, yeah, what we do is is almost identical to to traveling with the circus. You yeah. come to town, you put up the tent, you put on your show, clean up after the elephant, tear everything down, hit the road, and go do it again. Yeah. I mean, it's very, very similar, and you've you've got to you've got to love it. You you've got to love it. And I I have I have young people come to me all the time and say, I want to do what you do. What do I need to do to get your job? Mm-hmm. And I I say the same thing. I say, go to your local short track, volunteer to work for free. Tell them you you will work the entire season. They don't have to pay you a thing. You'll be the pit road announcer. You'll be the victory lane announcer. You'll be you'll be the guy that comes on in intermission when the real announcer goes to the men's right. room and tells people you know where they can buy a hot dog and get a cold beer. Mm-hmm. Do anything that they will let you do. Don't ask to be paid. Refuse to be paid, mm-hmm. and prove to them that you're willing to work hard. And then their face sinks. Seventy five percent of them say, "I'm not working for free." Well, it, it, then good luck. You, you're never going to get there. They they have no they, they you know they look at me and they say, well, you know, he's on MRN and he's on Sirius XM. What a great life! What a great job! And they're exactly right about that. Right. What they've skipped is 25 years of beans and weenies to get right. there. Right. You know, uh, yeah. Ain't so glamorous. It, it, it's not. And those are like you. You came from that. I came from that too. But lately, we are in such a social media type of world now. It seems like people are getting hired because of their followers and not because of their skill level. You know, what is, what's your take on that? They, they may get hired for that, but at a certain point after you've got the job, you've got to keep the job Mm -hmm. and keeping the job boils down to telling people things that they didn't know. Mm -hmm. If you're working as a reporter or a commentator in our sport, your job is to tell me something when I'm sitting at home in the Barca lounger you got to tell me something I didn't know. Mm-hmm. Don't don't tell me what I can see on television, right? You, you don't have to tell me that they're side by side. I can see that. Mm-hmm. Tell me something I didn't know. Tell me what that driver's going through right now. Tell me what he's thinking. Tell me what his strategy is. Tell me, you know, what's going to happen 20 laps from now based on what's happening right now. You can get the job based on social media likes. 
but congratulations, now you got to keep it. Right. And and I don't see a lot of people at the uppermost levels of our sport that are faking it. You're either doing the job and doing it well, or you've got a relatively short shelf life, and and it turns into whatever whatever happened to so and so, right? Is it is it uh, has the business itself gotten smaller with all the technology and everything involved and in, in, yeah. in doing stuff? Yeah, I think it has, and and we've also we've also gone further down the road toward what Howard Cosell called the jockocracy. What what is that? Well, it, he he hated the fact that in every booth for every NFL game, every Major League Baseball game, every NBA game, the color guy was not an expert on the game necessarily. He was a former player. And Howard Cosell called it the jockocracy. And he, he, he obviously was threatened by it because he was never a jock. He, he wrote a book called I Never Played the Game. Mm-hmm. He was a brilliant man. One of the one of the greatest analysts and color commentators in the in the history of television sports, but he was very much threatened by the fact that they're going to bring in Dandy Don Meredith, and and you know, Dandy Don Meredith, as great a guy as he was, he didn't give you very many complex thoughts on strategy. Okay, you know, he he was too busy singing "Turn Out the Lights," the parties, <laughs> you know, and, and and it was great and it was fun, but Cosell rebelled against that and said why are the why are these people in the booth and you look at it now and and we it's always been that way because when ken squire started out doing the daytona 500 he had david hobbs alongside or he had ned jarrett alongside there's always been a little bit of that right jackie stewart i can right. remember doing nascar <laughs> yeah. right but, but if you look around now there's only one mike joy and there's only one rick allen mm-hmm. everybody else Former drivers, right. former crew chiefs. Well, and you know what the thing is too is I try to explain to people you've got what three guys in the booth, three guys on pit road. There's a half a dozen seats to be filled. Mm-hmm. It is harder to get a job in a TV position than it is to get a job driving one of those race cars. Probably right. Well, because equally hard at least. About, yeah, you're right. There's about 40 per division between Cup, Bush and, uh, Cup Xfinity and Truck, right? Yep. 40 cars. There's yep. 120 seats compared yep. to a uh, half a dozen. That's it, true. It, it, it's uh, never thought of it that way. Well, that's depressing. Isn't it? <laughs> All right. I got to go back to work, man. I got to. I got to keep some kid from stealing my job. What What are some of those newer changes that you are noticing in in the business now compared to way the way you guys were doing it back in the day? It's interesting how much stuff can get done remotely now. Really? I mean, you and I are not sitting at the racetrack having this conversation. If we wanted to, we could have we could have punched a couple of buttons on the keyboard, and I could have stayed at my house, and you could have stayed at your house, right. and, and done it on the Zoom. Right, right. right. And and there are uh, there are broadcasts on television where the announcers are not physically at the racetrack. What's your take on that? It's the wave of the future. I, I, you know, it's going to happen. There's not a damn thing we can do to stop it. It's budget. It, sure it is. Yeah. Sure it is. Everybody wants to keep the majority of their money. I'm that way too. That's how it works in my house. I want to keep the majority of my money, mm-hmm. and I, I can't criticize it because I have a studio in my house. Right. I've done Sirius XM Speedway from home for the vast majority of the last twenty years. When I lived up in Vermont. The only choice was to build a studio in my house. I wasn't going to commute to Charlotte every day. Really? So so I built a studio. I'm now on about my fourth set of high-tech technology, right? right. The, the system that we used when I started, it, it, it's it's like the gramophone now, right? I mean, it's in a <laughs> junkyard somewhere. I've thrown away three different sets of technology and updated to the new thing in 20 years, and, and I'm probably about ready to do it again. And, and that's the thing. You have to be your own engineer too, don't mm-hmm. you? Like you have to figure out how all this stuff goes yeah. together. And I did that for years. You when, did? Back, back when I was working for Ken Squire at his radio stations, okay. between, you know, in the wintertime, winter in Vermont, right? It's 30 below zero for 30 consecutive days. But we would do high school and college basketball and hockey every night. I mean, I would do six games a week, every week. And and I was a one-man band. You set up your equipment, 
you test you, you test the lines to make sure you can be heard back at the radio station. You go and record an interview with one of the coaches for the pregame show. You write all the lineups down in your scorebook. Once the game starts, you're doing color. You're doing play-by-play. You're keeping your own stat book. You're doing the halftime show. One-man band, man. It, it's small market, you know, small market, small town radio. It's a lot of work, but boy, you learn a lot. Right, you're you're doing it all yourself. You know what the funny thing is, is what you just described is very similar to what the streaming uh, uh, mm-hmm. video setups are doing now. Because that that's what it is. It's a one man band, one yep. person with a camera and a Terra deck, you know, to get it an internet signal, and you know that's that's how they do it, and that's how yep. they 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 go out. I did. Uh, has streaming affected your business at all in, in any way, or, or how you do things? It, on the video side, the the video product, it's definitely affected us. You've got, uh, and there there are so many opportunities out there now. There's, if anybody's got the desire to to talk to people about motorsports, technologically speaking, and in terms of finding someone that you know a way to distribute what you're doing, there's an ungodly amount of opportunity that wasn't there 20 years ago. Mm-hmm. You know, there, you couldn't have your own YouTube channel 20, nobody even, right. knew, you know, there was no YouTube there. Uh, all you could do was kind of what I did. You know, you, you could call up Val Lassure and say, I'd like to write a column on the Northern late model circuit. You know, could I do that? And he'd say, sure, but it doesn't pay. Okay. I'll do it anyway. Right. That, that was about it. If you, if you wanted to do it and you wanted to get noticed, there were very there were very few ways to get noticed now and, and and we kind of we kind of deride it to some degree but everybody with a cell phone now is a journalist i know you know you, you see these young people and god bless them they're trying right they're trying to get in you see these young people standing in the back of the uh, of the the mass you know we call them gangbang interviews mm-hmm. in the garage and they're standing up there and they're holding their phone 8 feet in the air mm-hmm. and then they go they go back to the media center and they go blip blip bloop and they put it on their YouTube channel and all of a sudden they're a journalist. Well, there, there's a little more to being a journalist than right. that, but, but they're trying, right? It's a start. I, I get it. No, I know what you mean. Um, the, the, that is actually what we're doing with this show. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the, when COVID, when the pandemic hit, you know, it took a lot of those positions away, mm-hmm. you know? So we got to a point where I was like, well, if we're going to be on TV, we got to put ourselves on TV. Yeah. And that's what we did coming up with this show. And, and we've been trying to, to keep it going from, from there. But uh, yeah, it has been harder and harder to stay in the business, uh, you know, keeping that longevity like you were talking about. Um, the, uh, what, uh, what, what is it that you enjoy about it still to this day? I mean, God, for doing it this long, I mean, at any point did, did burnout come in? Because it definitely did for me. It, it comes in every week at yeah. a certain point. Sure, yeah. You know, I'm I'll be 63 years old in a minute here, and yeah, I I, I joke that you know you I for 63. Yeah, oh, sure. Yeah. I've I've uh, I've evolved the way the sport has evolved. You know, back in the day, we used to throw the green flag, and if nobody wrecked, we'd go all the way to the finish without stopping. That's the way I used to climb the ladder up to the turn position. I'd grab the first rung and I'd right to the top. Now I do it in stages. I climb for a minute and then I rest. <laughs> then I climb for a minute and I rest. I, I've evolved the way NASCAR has. So yeah, it's it's still difficult. But the thing I loved about it most day one is what I still love about it, and it's the people. Mm-hmm. There are just some yeah, and you know, I'm not telling you anything. There are just some amazing, dedicated, intelligent, passionate. People. Passionate. They'll yes. get mad at you too. More than anything oh, they'll else. They'll get mad at oh, you. Oh yeah, I've had that before. You know, Tom, if I had a dime for every time Tommy Baldwin gave me the finger over the years, sure. You oh know, really? That's a, but I love the guy. I know. Right? I love the guy. He's on the Hall of Fame voting committee, and and every year for the last three or four years, we we cast our vote, and then one like while they're tallying everything up, he and I go to the Buffalo Wild Wings and have a couple of beers together. <laughs> but there have been times where I've said something that he didn't like, and you know he'd be walking through the garage, and I'd get the old "You're number one" salute. I'd go over. Say, all right, Tommy, what are you mad about this time? And oh, we'd, okay. we'd fight for a minute, and then we'd be fine. It's oh, all good. It, 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 were there any other of those those guys that you had a little scuffles with or disagreements I've with? I've been pretty fortunate in that regard. Um, the only one really, and I'm not, I won't use any names, but... You know, back in the day, we used to have that owner points deal. And owner points, you know, bad teams would sell their owner points to good teams that were looking to expand. And it was just, it was a goofy way of doing business. Mm-hmm. And I, I was always pretty outspoken about it. But they had a they had a team owner 
that sold his owner points to a big team. And I found out about it. And my motto has always been, I'm going to talk to you before I talk about you. So I called him and I said, here's what I'm hearing. You've sold your points to so-and-so and and they're going to be running your owner points going to Daytona. Absolutely not. Never happened. Nope, 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 nope. And I knew it. I I knew he wasn't telling me the truth. Mm -hmm. So I called the team that he had sold his owner points to and talked to their PR guy. And he said, would it be helpful if I faxed you over a copy of the contract that he signed yesterday? (laughs) I said, okay, not, not necessary to do that. I called, called the owner back. I said, okay, it's not against the rules to lie to me. I've been lied to before, but here's the problem I'm in. And he didn't answer. So I'm leaving him a voicemail. Mm -hmm. Here's the problem I've got. I know that what you told me isn't true. I know the truth and I'm going to report on the truth. What I'd like to do here is give you an opportunity to backtrack and unsay the things that you said to me before. Well, give me a statement. So, so that you don't look really dumb when I say, talk to so-and-so today. He denies doing it, but here's the contract. Right. I don't want to do that to you. Right. I want to give you the opportunity to kind of, you know, rephrase. Right. I said, and I'm on the air in, the, in an hour. So you got an hour. Mm-hmm. Call me back or don't. It's up to you. Well, he didn't. And I told the story, and like the minute I got off the air, my phone was ringing, and he was mad as a wet cat. (laughs) And I I just said, I'm sorry, man. It's not, I I cannot save you from yourself. Right. So it happens every once in a great, great while, but the vast majority of the time, I'm very fortunate. I enjoy great relationships with that people, with the people in that garage. I've always found if you treat them with respect, you'll get respect back. Yeah, that was one of the things, too, that I always liked about you because you always had this common sense, you know, uh, no bullshit type of attitude towards, you know, the sport, too. Mm-hmm. And you try to you try, I see that you try to uh, give that information or parlay that information out to the callers that call into your mm-hmm. show. I mean, first off. OK, here it comes. God bless you. Here it comes. OK, <laughs> yeah. you have got some patience to deal with some of those callers because, man, they just call up either they're spewing venom or they just have. I'm going to say it. They got their head up their ass. I love them, though. <laughs> I, I, I love them. And, and here's why. Sports talk radio, in my opinion, is the last bastion of free speech in this country. Mm-hmm. Talk radio used to be. The vast majority of talk radio is political in nature. Mm -hmm. And there's nobody in the middle, right? You're either way over there on the right or you're way over there on the left. I'll use the late Rush Limbaugh as an example. And and I can't criticize anything Rush Limbaugh did because he was a billionaire based on what he did on the radio. Mm -hmm. But if you listen to Rush Limbaugh's show, he would talk for an hour about his political philosophies and you know he was very much conservative you never heard anything on his show that wasn't conservative right and the only callers that got on the air were the ones that wanted to say mega dittos rush you're the smartest man on the planet i've never disagreed with you on anything and you're wonderful and i love you thank you very much goodbye right nothing like so that so th- so there's no new territory being scout it there, right? You're only going to hear one thing, one side. You're right. You're right. You're right. I couldn't imagine doing that. I, you, well, one of the things that, that I try to do with this show is we try to talk real on this show. Mm-hmm. You know, um, we, I, I see a lot of racing related shows out there that are just ass kissing sessions. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it, you know, if, not mine, not yeah, No, not yours. And that's what I love about it too. But you know, if we, if we say that you ran bad, you ran bad period. Mm-hmm. That's it. Yeah. And that was the, okay. Here's the other question. When did telling the truth make you an asshole? Um, well, I guess it depends on your point of view, right? If, if I'm telling the truth about you and it's not something you want to hear about yourself, I, I guess I'm an asshole. Oh, but, yeah. but that's okay. See, but, that's okay. But people can't hear, the, you know, you can't go to someone and say, man, you ran like shit tonight. They lose their, they have a meltdown and, and then they'll trash you on Facebook and Twitter and everything. It's like, no, you ran like shit. You know, go back, work yeah. on the car, come back and run better than th- next week. Right. Like you, the, these, these people can't be told that you ran terrible it's it's i'm pretty dedicated to the fact that uh, i understand my job really well Mm -hmm. done it long enough i understand my job my job as the host on uh, uh, monday through friday is to give you my opinion 
explain what's going on, explain things about the sport that you might not have known or understood. But it's to give my opinion and then to get you to give me yours. Mm -hmm. Nowhere in there did you hear me say, you have to agree with what I said. Mm -hmm. Nowhere in there did I say, you have to say something that I will agree with. And, and the one thing that bothers me more than anything else is that to a certain percentage of the people that call into my show, the success or failure of our interaction in their minds is whether or not I agree with them at the end of our conversation. Who cares if I agree with you? Right. Who cares? I'm, I'm just one guy with one opinion. You're one guy with one opinion. Do you worry about losing fans if you piss them off on the air? Not a bit. No, really? Okay. No, no not a bit. Okay. Because uh, uh, I've got... I've got four or five people. They don't call in every day or even every week. But you know when they call in, they tend to be a tad on the cantankerous side, mm -hmm. right? And they're not going to be happy about something. When you hear from Ed in Idaho, he's going to be upset about something. Mm -hmm. and, th and that's fine with me mm -hmm. as long as you understand that when you say this, this, and this are true, you got to be ready mm -hmm. because I'm going to respond with what proof do you have that those things are true? Okay. What do you other than other than the fact that that's my opinion and I'm entitled to it, which you are? Right. Tell me why what you said is accurate. Right. What kind of data do you have to back it up? Exactly. Okay. And and if you don't have anything to back it up, be prepared because I'm going to say your submarine has a screen door, <laughs> and I'm going to tell you exactly where that screen door is located. Right. You know, I'm 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 all for people calling up and bitching about what they didn't like. Right. But be prepared, because when you're done bitching, I'm going to say, okay, you've done the easy part. Now let's do the heavy lifting. What do you want to do instead? Right. And the vast majority of them immediately default to, well, that's not my job. That's NASCAR's they, they job. That's, an that's not my job. And I said, well, it's not your job to bitch either, but you took it upon yourself. I gave you six minutes. <laughs> you, you know, you, you vented your spleen. I'm just curious if you want to do the hard work. Right. Most don't. They just want to feel better after they complain for a while. And that's fine. How many times have you gotten in trouble in the past? Because uh, obviously your opinions, uh, uh, you know, you are an opinionated show. Mm -hmm. And I know that callers have called in and yelled at like, oh, you know, you work for NASCAR, so you have to be all you're on the You're on the take. You're on the take and all that, which, and, which is not true because... I know or, or have heard of you have gotten called if, into the NASCAR hauler a couple of times. If anybody knew my history. Because I sure as hell have. If, if anybody knew my history, and, and I want to say this very clearly, NASCAR's been really good. Right. There's never been a moment where uh, during the 20-year run of our show where NASCAR has said, you can't say that, you can't talk about that, here's what you have to say instead. It's never happened. And if it does, that'll be the last day on the job for me. Okay. But people that know my history know that back in the old NASCAR North days when I was working up north, NASCAR ran our short track circuit with the exact same rules and the exact same procedures that they used at Daytona. And it didn't work. Mm -hmm. It didn't work. Right. And and we had a deal where, you know, lawsuits got involved. We had a championship decided based on, you know, who won in court. And NASCAR pulled their sanction and left New England. And I was very critical of that. What year was this? Oh, it was like 83. 80s. Yeah, 80s, right? mid 80s. Okay. And I was highly critical of it. And and they expected that when they left, the, the guy that ran the tour, Tom Curley, was just going to shut it down and go home. Mm -hmm. well, they didn't. Kept right on going. Mm -hmm. He changed the rules a little bit, converted from a steel-bodied NASCAR late model to a, what they call up north of Pro Stock, a super late model, and kept right on trucking. Mm -hmm. And NASCAR, within a year or so, figured out that they had really screwed up. Because they had just given New England away. So they came back and said, we're bringing back the Bush North series. Mm -hmm. And at that moment, it turned into an absolute turf war. ACT on one side, Bush North on the other side. Competing for tracks, competing for dates, competing for drivers, competing for sponsors, competing for fans. And it was ugly. Really? Oh, uh, people that had been friends for 50 years stopped talking to each other based on the fact that I ran ACT and you run NASCAR North. Wow. And and it cost me. Uh, I was working maybe four or five races a year for MRN back then, mm -hmm. you know, when, when somebody needed a, work, a week off. I was not full time. Mm -hmm. And 
I got the word at one point after you know this turf war had gone on for a couple of years. It, they made it. They made it very clear: if you work for them, you can't work for us. You you can't you can't be in both. You can't have a foot right. in both camps. Right. You got to either be a NASCAR guy or an ACT guy. Well, I was I was working fifty races a year for ACT and four for MRM. That was an easy call. Right. And I went away for a number of years Mm -hmm. until finally enough time passed that that those wounds began to heal. And and you could you could actually talk to people that raced on the other circuit again. And MRN called me back and said, we'd like to have you come back and go to work. And I've been there ever since. I I know I've gotten I've gotten in trouble uh, uh, a few times. Uh, Yeah, it was critical on a radio show one time about a modified race that Mm -hmm. two announcers were not prepared for they were screwing names up and all that and i just i I just said that like it's got to be really frustrating for the producers involved that are putting together this great show and then have it fall short by you know the the people that are not doing their job or have done their homework and man my phone lit up after that race was uh, after that show was over and i have not been back in the booth since right so i I i've been very fortunate in that regard that that i've never the, the folks at NASCAR understand what my job is. Mm. They understand that there are going to be times where I disagree with things that they do. Um, do you remember Ramsey Poston? He was their chief PR guy for like I do remember about a name. decade or so yeah, ago. Yeah, I remember the name. The closest I ever came, I was never a big fan of, of, and I'm still not, of leaving the shop on Thursday knowing who's qualified for today's race because we've got all these plans and past champions provisionals and this, that, and the other. And and I didn't I, I was critical of it and I said it's not qualifying day it's a ranging day we already know who's in the race we knew before we even left the shop based on owner points and all these cockamamie provisionals mm-hmm. it's ju- we're just arranging them who starts first and who starts last and a couple of weeks later I'm walking toward the media center and I just happened to be walking next to Ramsey Poston who's NASCAR's guy and he said I understand the way you feel about our qualifying system. All I ask of you is that when you do get up on your soapbox and start calling it a ranging day, that you also be fair enough to give our side of the story and why we do it the way we do it. And I stopped dead in my tracks, and he stopped right with me. And I turned, and I looked at him, and I said, Ramsey, have I ever not done that? And he went, you're right. We're good. That's all they've ever asked. Okay. Two sides to every story. Don't just give yours. Right. Tell, tell people ours. That seems uh, fair to me. It, it is. You have yeah. to give both both sides. Yeah. Of it. A- a- absolutely. Uh, you know, it's funny. You were talking about the ACT days and everything. Uh, let's get to Tom Curley. Oh, it was man. another another guy you got an education from. For sure. Uh, I did not know him very personally, but I did know he was a no bullshit kind of guy. Oh, yes. And he was one of those guys that believed in the philosophy that you don't have to like me, but you have to respect me. Right. He um, he was a phenomenon. There were there were times where, uh, I mean, I, there, there were days where I would walk through fire for the man, and he inspired that kind of loyalty in his people. You would literally run through the wall for him. But there were also a lot of days where if I if I'd had a gun, I'd have shot him. <laughs> and you know, and, and he he would always say, you know, he was fiery, uh, he, and and he was right even when he was wrong, right? And that can be frustrating yeah. to work with somebody that's right every time, my way or the highway. Well, was he the type you couldn't tell him anything? Oh, you couldn't tell him anything. No. Oh, really? No, oh, no, not at all. <laughs> no, no, he knew. And 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 he he always chalked it up. He said, "Well, you know, I'm Irish. It's my it's my fiery Irish temper." And I I stood next to the man in in race control boxes for 30 years, right? Me right here, him right there. Mm -hmm. We knew each other pretty well, and we had a level of candor with each other. Mm -hmm. And about the 500th time, he justified one of his eruptions to me by saying, well, you know, I'm Irish, and I've got a temper. I said, Tom, yes, you are Irish, but you're also an asshole sometimes. (laughs) And he looked at me like... <laughs> and, and I could see it going through his head. How am I going to argue with this? Because I know it's true. Oh my God! That's but great. but he he was able to see where racing was going to be five, seven, ten years from now. In in what way? Uh, well, like the cars or the rules? All of the above. But really? he was the first back in the late seventies to say, like like we touched on earlier, we can run 
steel-bodied late models at this track every Thursday night, every Saturday night if we want to. But we're not putting enough people in the stands to pay for these cars anymore. Mm. These cars have evolved to a technological level where it's expensive to run them. Mm. And we can't pay that every single week. We cannot put enough fannies in the stands to underwrite that kind of a ticket. And he was the first to say, what we need to do is we need to take them on the road. We need to race them here four times a year. And we need to race them in Oxford, Maine four times a year, and Thompson Speedway twice, and Stafford Speedway once, and go to Quebec, and go to Ontario, and go to the Maritimes. So we're not, we're not destroying those tracks by forcing them to pay that purse every week. They only have to do it two or three times a year as a big-time special event. Mm -hmm. He saw that way before anybody else saw it. And, and that's just one example. He was so good at positioning his series and saying, okay, five years from now, we damn sure better be doing this a little differently than we're doing it now. He was a genius. His, his people skills were C minus D plus. <laughs> if, if he had had the people skills, if he had had Squire's people skills, yeah. uh, you know, he and Ken were partners, but, but Ken did not run the tour. Ken was off doing his CBS deal. Right. Tom ran the tour. If you could have taken Tom's knowledge and combined it with Ken's ability to communicate and make people love him, mm -hmm. oh my God, he would have owned the world. Really? Owned the world. Uh, that was what I was going to ask. Like, why didn't Tom, like, kind of work his way up the the the, the ladder or, or work down in Daytona? That was going to be my next question. You guess just, he just answered it. He, he, yeah. He, he, would, he would go to Daytona. And he'd say, why the hell do you do it that way? That's a stupid thing to do. Yeah. Not the it, thing to say in a you meeting. Don't, you know, you, you, don't sit across, you don't sit across from Jim Hunter and Jim France Jr. and say, you're a bunch of idiots. Yeah. No. You're running your circuit wrong. That's probably not going to happen. I understand. Uh, from all of the years, though, uh, on the the short tracks, uh, what and of course we're seeing more short tracks uh, shut down. We're seeing you know more of them have less and less people in the stands. Mm -hmm. They're putting eight divisions out there sometimes each week just to be able to pay the purse the back gate. What are some of the things that? Some of these short tracks need to do to put fans back in the seat. Oh, is it you're in my make, wheelhouse now. Is it make like amenities like a barbecue areas and bars and and things like that, or and playgrounds for the kids? Or like what is it? Yeah, you're you're right in my wheelhouse now because I go to local short tracks and it just angers me what they do. Um, asphalt short track, seven o'clock post time. 740 they haven't done a damn thing yet mm. you're just you're, you're just sitting there you're sitting there and, and you look up at the tower and the race director standing outside smoking a cigarette no sense of urgency right. no concerns that that the crowd's been sitting here for 40 minutes now and you've not you've taken their money but you haven't given them anything back right they run eight divisions like you say it's it's 15 minutes between every heat race because they're disorganized Right. If, if if Harvey in the back, his car's not ready yet, we'll give him 15 minutes to get ready to run this heat. Single car spin, no contact, no debris, no nothing. 20 minutes to reset the starting lineup and throw a green flag again. Victory lane that lasts 25 minutes because you got a photographer that needs 12,000 pictures of this guy. Or they interview second and third. That's a... You, that, you can interview second and third, just don't ask them nine questions each. Well, the one thing that drives me nuts with uh, uh, interviewing second and third is sometimes it'll take five minutes just to do one interview. So if you... It should. It's, it's five, to, five minutes for first, second, third, there's 15 minutes right there. Yeah. Well, guess what? Four races in, now you're an hour, you know, an hour is gone out of your program. Yeah. Like, I just talk to the winner. Like, they should get the accolades. We, uh, a lot of the MRN guys, I mean, we're all short track guys at heart. Right. And every once in a while, when we're out on the road, we'll go to the local short track. And a few years ago, and I'm not going to use any names, it doesn't matter. We went and it said, oh, uh, such and such a speedway is running twin 75s for the late model stocks tonight. Great, let's go. So they start off and they run the first 75 lapper. And it's all heads up qualifying based on time trials. Fastest guy on the pole, slowest guy in the back. They throw the green flag. The guy's two car lengths ahead in turn one, five car lengths ahead in turn two, 10 car lengths ahead in turn three, and wins by about 30 car lengths and is never challenged. There right. was not a pass. After the first corner, there was not a pass in the top. Five. Leads every lap. Guy climbs out of the car in victory lane, jumps up on the roof, dances the Watusi like he's just done something spectacular, does a 
eight minute interview with the track announcer that never asks him a question. And then I swear to God, after the after the junk that we just sat through for the last 45 minutes, the announcer says, and don't forget, ladies and gentlemen, based on his win here in the first 75, Harvey Whipplesmith will start on the pole for the second race yeah. coming up later tonight. <laughs> and 300 of the 400 people in the grandstands grabbed their coolers and said, the hell he will. And they left. Mm-hmm. And And... It's a mystery to that promoter why he can't. I, I had a conversation two years ago with a promoter here in the South. And he's, and he, I, I'm not making this up. He said these things to me literally within a three minute time span. He said, My fans don't care how late we run. If we go till three in the morning, man, they love it. The, the more racing we give them, the better they like it. Six hours, seven hours, they don't care. And then in the next breath, he says, but I can't put more than 700 people in here on a weekly basis, no matter what I do. And I wonder I, why. And I said to him, I said, does it occur to you that those 700 people are the only ones left after you've treated them like garbage by expecting them to stay here until three o'clock in the morning? No, nah, no, nah, that's not it. Good luck to you with your <laughs> weekly program. I, I get it. You know, crazy. Short tracks for all intents and purposes too are are mom and pop businesses and you've got some of those that understand the changing times and and get it and then there are some that are just let things just go to rot and waste and i mean uh berlin is doing a fantastic job in michigan with putting the sweets in and they have uh barbecue decks out in in one of the corners uh stafford another one they've got like a a bar area or Mm. or a patio that you can watch the races from as well and there are a lot of track owners out there there are fewer and fewer promoters right they open the gates and they expect you know something where where are the people Mm -hmm. well you didn't you didn't tell them there was a race that might have been a mistake Mm. You didn't do any advertising. You didn't do any promoting. Your your website doesn't even have the results from last week's race up yet, much less any promotion for this week's race. Yeah. 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 You understand. expect them to show up just because they're psychic, apparently. What is your opinion or your take on some tracks uh, dropping their NASCAR sanctioning? Because we have seen that in the co- last couple of years. Like most recently, Stafford. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, Stafford... Uh, they basically told NASCAR, "No, we're gonna we're gonna try to operate without you." What do you, what's your take on that? And I think, it, correct me if I'm wrong. I think that one all came down to streaming rights. That, I don't know that, that Stafford wanted to stream it through a certain outlet, and NASCAR had their certain outlet, and they they kind of clashed over that. But you know, everybody's got to do their own math. Mm-hmm. And if you own a racetrack, it costs you a certain amount of money to get that NASCAR sanction. And in return, you get certain things, most notably their insurance policy mm-hmm. and, and an opportunity if you're running the proper divisions to have your drivers compete for a national championship. And, and every track has to do their own personal math. Is, is what I'm paying to be a part of NASCAR worth what I'm getting as a member of NASCAR? And, you know, it's always been fluid over the years. Some tracks decide that it's not the right thing for us right now. And some tracks decide that it is the right thing for us right now. You just, like I said, you got to do your own math and see how it all adds up. When when Winston was around, um, they just influxed so much money, not only to the Cup Series, but all the way down to the short tracks. I mean, you yeah. had the Winston Racing Series. There's a reason why virtually every track in, in the United States at some point or another was painted red and white. Right. Because Winston gave them the paint. Yeah. <laughs> Here you go. Yeah. Paint it up like a Winston box. Red, white, red. Great, g- fantastic idea of marketing. Free too. paint. Do you ever think that we will see a day where we will have those sponsors like that come back for that long of a period of time? I mean, because they were in the sport for over 20 years. Yeah. And nowadays we're seeing sponsors quickly come and go. It's tough now because there's ju- there are just so many things to do. You know, when I was a kid uh, growing up in central Vermont, on Thursday night you had about two choices. You could go to Thunder Road or you could go to the movies. And, and we had one movie theater. It wasn't one of these multiplexes where you could pick from 13 movies on any given night. You had one movie, and sometimes it would be there for three weeks, right? right. Well, and we had three channels on TV, and in the summer, only two of them came in. I know. So what are you going to do on Thursday night? Let's go to the racetrack. Mm-hmm. Now there's just so much competition. I mean, everybody on planet Earth has the world in their pocket, right? Pull your phone out. 
watch yeah. watch races from anywhere in the country or watch movies while you're well, sitting at a different track sure. too. Yeah. yeah why not I, I know uh, uh the um I can't multitask I can't watch one race while being at another I can't keep up did you ever think that we would get to a point in short track racing where short tracks like where you and I came from are now getting into tiffs over television rights like I, I, I no. Did I envision that? No. Me neither. No. Uh, because there was no way for your local track to get on TV. Mm-hmm. You were you were lucky if your local TV station gave your race results on on Monday night or whatever. Mm-hmm. It, it, that was that was a miracle if you could get them to do it. But now it's like you and I have been talking about. There's so much technology out there mm-hmm. that it's that it's doable for your local racetrack to be on the World Wide Web. And have people across the country or across the world tune in. You know, I, I sat in a meeting last night. We had a Zoom meeting last night. Uh, there's a group of us from back home that are that are trying to create a Vermont Motorsports Hall of Fame. Cool. And and the group of twelve or fifteen people that I was talking with, more than half of them weren't even in Vermont. They live elsewhere now, but they're like, yeah, we watch the races every week. We, we stream the race every single week. I, I, I go to Thunder Road every week without leaving my house, and I'm the same way. Mm-hmm. I, I, watch, I watch every Thursday night. Okay. But I only get to one or two in person. Right. The rest of the time, I'm in North Carolina, and I've, I've got the stream up on my, on my big screen in the living room, and I'm watching the races. So you guys are trying to put together a Vermont Hall of Fame. Yeah. How... How has that been going, and how much of an undertaking has it been? Well, we just had our first meeting last night, and I think you know we have we have reasonable goals and expectations. Um, we're, we're not looking at this point at a brick and mortar museum, um, but a, a traveling display of mm-hmm. some sort, and a, and an annual of event uh, an annual event where you crown a Vermont racer of the year. And, and there's a lot going on. You know, it's not just stock cars. It's, you know, snowmobile racing and supercross and rally racing. It, it's, you know, it's a really eclectic state in terms of finding right. a lot of different kinds of motorsports. It's not just circle track racing. No, no, it's right. really not. Okay, that, that's interesting, actually. Um, the uh, one, There was one other thing I was going to ask you, too. God, I just slipped my mind. <laughs> I have that effect on people. It's going to happen with old age. Um, the... the um, what what do you th- like? Th- there's so much technology involved now, streaming and all of that. Um, are these are these tracks? Is it becoming a dying thing? Because we saw we had Chris Romano on the show. Mm-hmm. Okay, Chris Romano. I don't know if you would know who he is. Long time sure. writer. He's just he was a great mentor to me. Midget guy. Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. And he and I. He said to me, nobody's interested in being a local hero anymore. That was one of his things. He said, the, these kids, they win a race at their local track, and then they're off in a series somewhere, and yeah. then we don't see them ever again. Yeah, that's true. And it's sad because, you know, one of the first things Ken Squire caught, taught me when I started back in the late 70s, early 80s, he'd point out to the racetrack, and he'd say, you see that guy that just won his heat race? He may be picking up your garbage tomorrow, but mm-hmm. tonight he's a hero. And right. you need to make him a hero, and you need to treat him like a hero because he's doing something that very few people are able to do or willing to do. Mm-hmm. He might, might pick up your garbage tomorrow, but tonight he's your hero. You know, and and my heroes back then were Dynamite Dave Dion and the Dragon Brothers and the Tampa Tornado Robbie Crouch. Mm-hmm. Not a one of them ever went cup racing. Right. Never one. Not a one of them ever beat Richard Petty, and it didn't matter to us. Because they were our heroes. Yeah, I yeah. The newspaper would come every weekend, and and I'd see that Richard Petty had won again, and, and I thought that he walked on water back then. And, and since I've gotten to know him, I realized that I was right all along. He does, <laughs> but but Richard Petty was like Richard Burton, right? The, you know, they like were a, celebrity. He was a drivers. movie star, right? right? right. You, you never expected to meet Richard Petty. Mm-hmm. It was Dave Dion and Bobby. You know, I, after the races were over on Thursday night, I'd go to the pits with my program and my ballpoint pen and, and get an autograph from every driver in the pits. And then next week, I'd be right back getting the same autographs from the same drivers on a brand new program. Didn't matter to me. They yeah. were heroes to me. Yeah. I didn't care that they'd never won the Daytona 500. Right. And 
their talent was probably good enough to race in the Cup it Series was. too, right? It was. Yeah. But, but they won the Milk Bowl, man. The right. Milk Bowl's way bigger than the Daytona 500. Right. I get it. I, I know what you mean. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, with those kids that are racing now, and this is another question that we've been tr- posing to a lot of the guests that come, come in, and, and you've seen it, uh, especially in the NASCAR ranks, what is the urgency with putting kids in the top level of racing? I think um, I think that auto racing has finally caught up with baseball, football, basketball, and hockey in that overreaching parents now see our sport as a means for them for their kid to get rich and famous, just like they used to see the NFL and Major League Baseball and the NBA and the NHL. Mm-hmm. You know, 35, 40 years ago, a parent couldn't realistically say, my kid's going to win the Daytona 500 someday. Now, okay, if your kid's racing go-karts and he's won three out of his last five, okay, we're going all the way. And I hear that every once in a while from people on my show. You'll get somebody that calls up and says, you know, my kid's racing carts right now, and he's really, really good. He's really good. And my eyes roll. It's like, God bless you. You love your kid, but he's probably not half as good as you think he is because he's your kid. Right. And then they'll say, where where should we go? Where should we drive next? What division should we be in? Where should I place him to get him to the top? And my answer to them is always the same. Don't worry about getting him to the top. Have fun. One, yeah, exactly. Yeah. One out of 10,000 kids racing go-karts is ever going to race in a NASCAR National Series right. event. Go bond with your kid. Go have fun with your kid. Go compete with your kid. Teach him how to be a good winner. Teach him how to be a good loser. Teach him the life lessons that he's going to need to be successful in whatever he or she needs to be successful somewhere down the road. Mm-hmm. Don't worry about him being the next Jeff Gordon because he's almost certainly not. Mm-hmm. Does it frustrate you when you see those those kids that they hop out of the car and they're, they they grab their phone and they're tweeting instead of grabbing wrenches and working on their stuff? It is. You know, I, if it did, and, and I guess to some degree it does, uh, but I'll, I'll ask you the same thing I ask my callers. Sure, now, now what do you want to do about it? We're going to take their phone away? No. We're going we're gonna to make them the only kid in fourth grade that doesn't have their own cell phone? Right, no, no I, you're probably not. I know. I, the, the entire world is buried in their phone. You've got yours in your pocket. I got mine in my pocket. We both had to mute them before we started doing this <laughs> yeah, we so we did. wouldn't get interrupted, right? Yeah, yeah we did. Yeah, so yeah, I, I just don't know that there's much we're going to do about that. It's the world now. You know, well, we could probably sit here and talk for hours and hours about uh, fixing the problems of the racing world. Sure. We really could. Oh, I've got uh, ideas. Oh, yeah? Like what? What do you got? Well, the, the, my favorite one is the all-star race. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we've messed around. With, we've had 100 different formats in the all-star race in the last 15 years trying to make it exciting. Mm-hmm. We took it to Wilkesboro last year, and we didn't need a format because Wilkesboro was exciting. But my idea for the all-star race for years, and I've been on a soapbox on this for years, but nobody will listen. Take the top 10 in cup, the top 10 Xfinity, the top 10 in trucks, put them all on the same racetrack at the same time, throw the green flag, and let them race. And when we're done, we'll have an overall winner. In one type and two of car, or there are other no, cars. No, oh, in trucks and in Xfinity. Absolutely. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, you want to do like a variety, like absolutely. they do road course racing? Absolutely. Huh? Yes. That's that's pretty interesting. I want Ben Rhodes going going wheel to wheel with Ryan Blaney, and if you know, and if one division's got the advantage over the other, okay, fine. Right. And at the end of the night, we'll have one overall winner and two divisional winners. It'll be like the Rolex Twenty Four at Daytona. Right. Right. Move the, move the mic just a little bit back, just a touch. You think yeah. anybody? You think anybody is gonna not watch that oh, race? I, one of well, one of the the formats that I always enjoyed was the truck race at Eldora mm-hmm. because. You had to race your way into the show through heat races. And if you ask me, why can't we do that with the Cup Series races? Instead of qualifying, you have you know X amount uh, in points. This is your heat race. X amount of points. This is your heat race. Yeah. If you finish within the top, whatever, you qualify for the race. Everyone else goes to the Conci. Here's and why. you got to try to race your way in. Here's why we can't do I that. I loved racing through your way into a show. That was, yeah. I, I do too. But if you remember... We tried that with that Xfinity Dash for Cash deal. 
the first year of the Xfinity Dash for Cash, they said, we're going to run heat races, and it's going to be great. These guys are going to be knocking the slobber out of each other, trying to win the pole. And it never happened. We mm. sent them out there for heat races, and they had done their personal math and said, I'm not tearing the hell out of my car for the difference between first and fourth in a 250-lap race. Right. I- I'll just finish seventh. Yeah. I-, I don't care. And the, and the heat races were stultifyingly dull. Nobody passed anybody. And in year two, they said, yeah, we're not doing that heat race crap anymore. It was stupid. They didn't give them any type of incentive, though? Like, you had to be... Starting position. Yeah. Because I thought the the, the Clash of the Coliseum, the heat races were fantastic. You, you know, having to watch these guys battle their way into the show. Right. And, and I think the difference is, and it's like your local racetrack. Where you start in a 35-lap race on a quarter-mile racetrack is critical. Mm-hmm. You're not going to come from 24th place to win. Mm-hmm. So so winning that heat race is really important. Mm-hmm. Winning a heat race to determine where you start in a 300-mile Xfinity Series race, doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. The difference between starting first and starting 10th is negligible. It's a 100-yard head start in a 250-mile race. Nobody cares. What I'm yeah, but it, my my philosophy on this though is you had, say you have a 300-mile race for that weekend. You do a 75 lap, a 75 mile heat race, a 75 mile heat race. There's 150. Now your main event's 150 laps. You know, we're not sitting there for hundreds and hundreds of laps anymore. Now that you've got a 150 lap race, which also now brings me to my next question. Uh-huh. We have, we have seen a car race at 200 miles per hour. We have also seen a car race at 200 miles per hour for 500 miles. Speed and endurance has already been proven, okay? And the problem with endurance races is they endure. Do you think that being that we are in a short attention span lifestyle, we should go to less laps? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And, and not only should we, we already are. Mm-hmm. I, I look at look at how many, I mean, Pocono, those 500 miles at Pocono, oh my God. I mean, it was just, it was awful. It's like doing time sometimes. Awful. Oh right. yeah. There mm-hmm. are people on death row that are less anxious to leave than people <laughs> were at Pocono. And and they've cut them back to 400, and the race is better. Okay. You know, and, and for the people that say, oh, absolutely not. It's got to be 500 miles. I've never heard a single person complain about running 300 at New Hampshire. Mm-hmm. They've run 300 milers at New Hampshire from day one. Mm-hmm. Nobody walks out of there feeling like they've been shortchanged. Mm-hmm. And you're right. We in modern society now we have the attention span of a goldfish. Mm. When we get to, they've done the studies. When we get to three hours, when that race gets to three hours, people just start to wander off into the wilderness and they don't come back. Mm-hmm. Which is why this past week, uh, you know, the race ran three hours and twenty five seconds. If they could have found twenty five seconds to save somewhere, it would have been perfect. Three hours is the promised land for these races. Okay, no more. Cool. You know, in a way. You have a huge responsibility with your job and what you do, and not just with being in the corners, but also on mm-hmm. Sirius XM or even race announcing because you know it's our job to make these guys look like rock stars. Sure. You know, and sometimes all it takes is one wrong line from us and we don't make them look, you know, we, we have the mic, we have the ability to make them look bad or look good. Like we have, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of responsibility to carry with us with some of these guys. That's true. But I've also never felt like it was my responsibility to protect anybody from their own stupid comments. <laughs> if, if driver Or actions, right? Right. If, right. if driver A wants to step in front of the cameras after the race is over and say something that's absolutely cockamamie and makes him look bad, it's not my job to say, well, you know, maybe he was right. No, he, he said something stupid. Mm-hmm. We've all done it, mm-hmm. right? I'll, I'll say something stupid again tomorrow. Stu- tune in, mm-hmm. 3 p.m. Eastern time. <laughs> I, I say stupid things every single day. It's okay. What uh, what What's your take on the bump and run? Because I come from, and I had Johnny Benson in here yesterday. He hate, He's like me. He hates it. Of course it. he does. He's I, old school. I hate it too. But at the risk of being repetitive here, what do you want to do about it? Police it, really, because... Okay, specific. So, okay. on the here's, last here's lap my of the Daytona 500, when somebody gets into the back bumper and moves him over and wins, you want to black flag the winner of the Daytona 500? Yeah, absolutely. I don't think you do. I do, because here's why. Here's my do. take on it, okay? If second place dumps the leader on the last lap coming to the checkered flag, and Bones Borsi uh, and I have talked and about And I didn't this. say dump. I said bump. Okay. Just moves him over a little. I, I hear you. You going to black flag him? <sighs> You know, 
No, but it's a hollow victory. It's it's a hollow victory because but you didn't use any skill. Said, but the first two words you said were no, but. It, it it's it's a hollow because you didn't win. Your desire yes, to drive like a scumbag won. Yes, you did. Okay, because it takes no talent to pop somebody in the corner and send yes, them it does. Up the track. Yes, it does. <sighs> could you do it? What's that? Or could 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 you could you climb into a car? Yeah, you forget I raced, so I, I've I been moved. I've been moved out of the way. I, it, I know you did, and I, that's why I'm asking you this. Yeah, could you climb into a car, mm -hmm. and on the final lap of the Daytona 500, be in second place on the back bumper of the leader, and be in position to move him out of the way without piling up the entire field or yourself, and then move, make the move that wins the Daytona 500? I can say with a lot of pride, I have never moved anyone out of the way. But that wasn't my point. Okay. My point was, even you as a very good racer, right? do you have the skill set to be second in line on the last lap of the Daytona 500? I, I get what you mean about Daytona, but what I'm talking about is a regular weekly, weekly race, mm -hmm. a weekend Saturday night race. Mm -hmm. um, we have gotten to the point now where we get to the white flag and you're expecting it. Yeah. You, you know? like oh, you're exactly right. You, we're, and, and here's the other thing, too. And this has been driving me nuts about late model racing lately because I love late model racing. Is that they're running a bunch of unnecessary laps? They get to two or three to go. Second place dumps the leader. They're shit talking a fight, and we have seen this episode over and over Enough and over again. Enough with the fight already. Yeah, yeah, I know. And and the problem is, Derek. And I agree with what you're saying. In theory, I agree with what you're saying. But the genie's been out of the bottle for so long now that we have kid. We have guys that are 20 years old right now that since they were old enough to be propped up in front of the TV, have watched people get knocked out of the way on the final lap. Yeah. This is not a new phenomenon. It's I, been going on for a long time, and I'm just not sure how you how you put the genie back in the bottle. I hate the Rubens Racing f philosophy. I do too. I, I can't stand it's it. It's a it, bad line from a terrible movie. Exactly. I, I know. And, and the people that I argue with on social media are like, Rubens Racing. And I'm, I'm like, no. no. I'm like, Racing's you know what? Racing. When, you, when people reply to me like that, I know right away you've never driven a race car. A absolutely. And I, I grew up at Thunder Road next to Tom Curley. And if you knocked the leader out of the way on the final lap, he'd black flag you. Perfect. And you know what? Nobody knocked the leader out of the way on the last lap. It's, and if they did, it was it was a legitimate dispute over territory because I was inside you just enough to push the point. I have been always under the firm belief that second dumps the leader, coming to the checkered flag, first and second get set down, third place gets the win. Period. End of story. If they did that... Over yep. and over, if they implemented that rule all across the country, mm -hmm. you would see less dirty driving. Isn't if a wonderful word? If. I if know. changes everything. Yeah, if, right? you, if, if your aunt had yeah. balls, it'd be your uncle. I get it. it. Yeah, yeah, if the queen was plumbed a little differently, she could have been king. <laughs> right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> oh, God. This has been fun. It really has. Uh, we, hope you, uh, we hope you've enjoyed yourself. Uh, I have. Today. We are great. getting near the end of the show. We've had a, a great time with you today. Uh, Talk about your show, plug it. Let's uh, let's let the fans know uh, where they can find you. Sirius XM Speedway, Monday through Friday, three to six Eastern on uh, Sirius XM Channel ninety. Okay, and uh, you're you're invited. You're invited to call in. Yeah, absolutely. I, I got to call in and say hello to you one day. I wish you would. I, I do. I definitely do. I'm, absolutely. Uh, going up to the modified race this weekend, so maybe I'll cool. give you an update of what happens there. Cool but Dave, thank you very much. My really pleasure. appreciate you coming Anytime. in. Anytime. It was awesome. Dave Moody, ladies and gentlemen, joins us on the Derek Pernasiglio Show. We want to thank all of you for joining us. And remember, you can follow us on all of our social channels at Twitter. I still call it Twitter and not X. Uh, at Twitter at RealDP Show. Also at RealDP Show on Instagram and on TikTok. You can find us on Facebook at the Derek Pernasiglio Show. And then also remember to hit that like and subscribe button right there down below. And subscribe to our YouTube channel at the Derek Pernasiglio Show. So, for Dave Moody. I'm Derek Pernasiglio saying thanks for joining us and we'll see you the next time. Bye.